What's up guys, welcome to round 10 of the candidates tournament. It was an exciting day. There was a lot of really cool games and some very interesting moments, which I'm gonna show you in just a minute. Before we get into that, let's take a look at the standings. Going into round 10, we have Nepo with six and a half in the lead, a full point ahead of Fabiano, who is the next closest. And then in third, a tie for third, we have Hikaru and Ding. Now, I wanna just remind you that at this level of chess, draws are very common. So to be a full point ahead of someone is pretty significant. To be two full points ahead of everyone else is very significant. So I'm not going to say that it's over, okay? But the next couple of rounds are going to be very crucial to see if, if anybody's going to be able to catch Nepo. And probably that's going to mean some of these players are going to need to start winning. And Nepo is either going to need to lose or certainly Nepo can't win any more games or it's, it's very unlikely that anyone is going to catch it. All right, so that's the standings. Before we jump into the games, in our game, um, you guys voted that you would like to play the move Castles, and I have responded with E5. So it is now your turn again. If you'd like to vote, let me know in the comments what move you'd like to play, whichever one I see the most of that has the most upvotes. That's what you guys will play. All right, having said that, let's go ahead and take a look at these games. We're going to start off with Nepo's game since he is currently in the lead, and he was playing with White. Here we go. So we get d4, and this is looking like it could be a Nimzo Indian if if uh, Nepo would have played knight to c3, but he does not do that. Knight to f3. You can play the Bogo Indian with check here, but it's generally kind of not as good as the Nimzo. One of the nice things about the Nimzo is a lot of times you can trade that bishop for the knight, create some weaknesses in white's pawn structure, but with the, the Bogo, you can't really do that. So he plays d5, and we get some sort of Catalan position here. Everybody kind of castles. Queen to c2 is one of the standard moves, just attacking the pawn. b5, It's uh, it looks scary because you're opening up the rook. And this is something that if you're a beginner, you have to be very careful. You have to be very careful playing moves like this. When you, you know, put some of your major pieces, so a king, a queen, or a rook in line with like a bishop like this, you have to make sure you know what you're doing. So a move like knight e5 looks pretty scary, but in this case, uh, it's actually fine. You can block, you know, with knight to d5 and you're, you're saving your rook. It's fine, but you just have to, to watch out for those kind of moves. But in this case, b5, a4, and now there's this line that's been, I guess, more popular as of late, bishop to b7. And it's interesting because you check the database, this move has like 70 over 70% draws. And occasionally white gets a win. I don't think black has ever won, at least not in the database on Lee Chess that I'm looking at. So, I'm not sure what the idea was behind that. Maybe Rajabov is okay with that. He was okay with drawing since he's playing with black or he felt like he was going to get some chances. I, I don't really know. But bishop to b7 is played. Uh, white captures the free pawn and now a6. And you might say, well, why doesn't white just like keep taking? You just want a pawn. Like why not just take the pawn? The issue is black's going to play knight takes a6. And after you play queen takes c4, it looks like, well, hey, I just like took all of black's pawns, right? Uh, Black's going to play the move bishop to d5, attacking your queen. And you have to kind of make this awkward decision of where do you move your queen to? Like if you go back to one of these two squares, let's just say queen d3, for example, Black's going to play knight to b4. They actually have this double attack on your queen and your rook. Now you can save the position by trading. And now you can move your queen somewhere. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Let's just say queen to d1. But look at this position for Black. He's got the battery lined up here on this diagonal. The queen is very active. This knight is very active. Pieces are looking pretty nice, and white is still kind of undeveloped. And so all of that compensation for a pawn, I mean, looks pretty good for, for black. So that's kind of the idea if you decide, you know, to accept that. And so Nepo chooses to just play knight c3, a nice developing move. Makes a lot of sense. We get some trades, and we get this position, which is pretty equal. Like I said, most of the games in this line end in draws. c5, there is a weakness here. Uh, this pawn might become a target, and you're going to see that's what Nepo tries to do. So he's relocating the knight over here to attack the pawn, right? But black has a lot of pieces to, you know, defend it. And so here we go. One, two, three pieces are attacking the pawn, but now bishop d5. Black has three pieces defending the pawn. You can try to play b3 to kind of like pile on the pressure, but black can actually not take. If they take, that's a big mistake because queen to b1 actually has this, uh, there's this tactic where if you move the queen somewhere, you're just losing your rook. 
and you don't want to take here because white simply takes here. So that's a little tricky line. But instead of taking, black can simply play c3. And even though you can take the pawn, they have knight to e4. And black's getting a lot of pressure. And it's still very equal, probably going to be a draw. So it doesn't really change too much. But in a game, Epo traded here. And, you know, we get some moves. I don't want to waste your time. It wasn't really super exciting. A whole bunch of trades. And at the end of the day, after this happens, this bishop is on a light, uh, light color squares. This bishop is on the dark color squares, opposite color bishop, and there's just even pawns. There's no way in the world anyone is going to win this position. And so they go back and forth and we get a draw. Now, I don't know if uh, Nepo was happy with this or not. Uh, the opening choice didn't really give him too many winning chances. But, you know, maybe he's okay with that because, hey, he's leading the tournament with six and a half. Like, he doesn't really need to go crazy for wins. He can just keep drawing. And unless uh, some of these other players are going to start winning, he's going to win, right? So, I don't know. That was a draw. Let's go ahead and jump over to Hikaru's game next. All right, now, before we get into this game, if you remember, Hikaru was tied for third. And so, if anyone has a chance besides Fabiano to catch Nepo... Uh, maybe it would be Hikaru or Ding. So keep that in mind as we look at this game. So we get a Sicilian main line here with the a6, which is the Nidorf. Okay, very standard stuff. Bishop to e3, e5, and now knight to f3. So it's more popular that the knight will go over to b3 and sit on the queen side, but knight f3 is um, a legitimate line as well. And so Hikaru chooses that one, knight to f3. And now we get knight to c6, which is not really uh, a standard move here. It's definitely like a logical move. You're developing a piece. But normally, black will play bishop to e7 first. Usually something like bishop c4. Black will castle. White will castle. And then I think at this point, either bishop e6 or knight c6 now is kind of when the knight might come out. Or maybe something like bishop e6, bishop e3, and then knight c6. This would be kind of the more main line. Faruja decides to play knight to c6 immediately, and Hikaru does spend, yeah, spends a little bit of time thinking uh, what to do and chooses kind of the natural move, bishop to c4. This is a nice diagonal. Now we get bishop to e6 and knight to d5. Rook to c8, pretty, you know, good square for the rook, lining up on the bishop, creating the discovered attack. Hikaru trades. And the normal sort of standard logical move you might think is queen takes f6, right? Arusha plays g takes f6. You can see the engine there saying, hold on a second, what, what's going on here? So um, the thing about moves like, well, first, first of all, let's back up. Generally speaking, when you think about pawn structures, okay, you want to have less pawn islands. Okay, this is a pawn island, and then this is currently a pawn island. So you have two pawn islands right now, and... White also has two pawn islands. You also don't want to have doubled pawns or isolated pawns. And when black captures this way, these are now doubled pawns. And this is an isolated pawn. And if we count the islands, we have one, two, and then three pawn islands. So from a pawn structure standpoint, that's not a good move. Now, why did Faruja play it then? Well, sometimes just because you, you, know, you mess up the pawn structure doesn't mean that that's the only thing that's going on. So for example, there's this open g file right a lot of the times white would like to castle on the king side well if white castles king side black might be able to now use this open file to attack the king okay so that's one idea another idea is you now have more central pawns and if let's just say hypothetically black is able to at some point push this forward trade this off push this pawn and push this pawn black is going to have this mass of pawns in the center that could be very difficult for white to to stop so there are trade-offs behind you know this move now that being said engine doesn't like it and what we're going to see over the next couple of moves is that there are some definitely some some drawbacks to that now Carl plays the move bishop to b3 which i think was a nice move i'm guess guessing that Faruja was kind of expecting that he was going to capture and then was probably planning on using this pawn to kind of support these guys pushing forward like i said get that mass of pawns moving but after bishop to b3 it's kind of like okay what are you going to do now with black and particularly, what are you going to do with your king? Are you going to castle kingside? Are you going to leave your king there? I, I don't really know, right? And so you're going to notice over the next couple of moves, Hikaru, by the way, does castle. He's not worried about this. Um, the bishops get traded. Okay, this pawn gets pushed forward. And we've kind of, the game has moved forward, but look at these pawns. 
right? This is kind of the story of the game. These are kind of weaknesses that Black hasn't really f solved yet. And so here we go. Rook comes to the open file, c4. Rook, nice square on d5 for the rook, supported by the pawn. This rook can come over if it needs to. And now he castles. But it's like, okay, well, your king is, I don't know. I mean, it's not as safe as it would be if the pawn was back on, on uh, g7 and maybe your bishop was over here or something, right? So rook comes over, rook comes over, h3, b5, c5. And right here was kind of the last moment for Ferruja to keep the game in somewhat equal territory, okay? If you look at the bar right now, it's not super high for white. Watch after this move. See how it jumps for a big advantage for white? The reason for that is this is a is a passed pawn. Okay, remember, a passed pawn means no pawns can stop the pawn on the way to becoming a queen. If you can get a passed pawn to become a protected passed pawn, which means it's protected by another pawn, which is exactly what happens after white's next move, that's a very dangerous long-term threat. Okay, black is going to have to constantly monitor this pawn with at least one piece. Because if you move all your pieces away, guess what? The pawn just goes and gets a queen. You have to constantly monitor it. That's the disadvantage um, in a situation like this. And when it's protected, you have no chance of really capturing it. It's just going to sit there because it's defended. So what black needed to play here was the move a5. And the whole point is we're not going to let white defend the pawn. And so therefore, it's now a target. It's, it's a weakness. I can now play bishop f8 and actually have chances of taking that because if white ever tries to defend it well i'll just take their pawn so this was a key move that Ferruja needed to play and the game is is still slightly better for white but it's nothing uh to write home about but after this now black's position is is not looking good at all this guy is kind of stuck unless you're willing to sacrifice it this guy is super strong um and look at black's king it's not really that great of a, of a spot for the king so that was kind of the story we get a trade here. Actually, this is a, sorry, this is a sacrifice. So the point behind allowing his knight to be captured is that he's going to be able to take Hikaru's rook, which you might say, well, hey, that's pretty good. I'm winning a rook. The problem is, even though he has these two rooks, what are they doing? They're stuck back there, not doing much. And again, we come back to this king safety issue. And one of the things in chess, queens and knights are like, two of the best pieces to comp to combo together so like if you have a queen knight combination attacking your opponent's king that's usually very very difficult to stop and that's exactly what we are seeing over here the queen is getting ready to come over along with the knight and these rooks aren't going to do anything to help the king look at how these pawns are just kind of blocking the rooks from coming over right they can't get over there and so yeah black has a rook but it's not going to really help him so that's kind of the issue and hikaru plays it great the queen comes over to h5 Rook comes here, uh, rook to a1. The rook comes up, but again, there's nowhere for it to go, right? I mean, look at these pawns. There's just nowhere for the rooks to go. Bishop comes in to eliminate kind of the only piece that's really defending the king, and then you're just going to have the queen and knight, and there, there's really nothing for black to do here. So rook a3, the rook can also join in as well. And we get a few more moves. And after rook to g3, uh, Feruja just resigned. There's no way to stop checkmate. Uh, yes, Black can take here with check, but after the king kind of tucks away on h2, this is just game over. There's there's no way to stop it. So, nice win for Hikaru. Uh, you know, it all goes back really to that decision to capture with the pawn. I think we would have had a completely different game if going all the way back to here, Feruja would have taken with the queen, right? You keep your pawn structure looking nice. You play bishop e7, you castle, the game goes on. Who knows what would have happened? But after the trade, and by the way, this is not like, oh, it's a terrible blunder. You know, how could he play that move? It's just a small inaccuracy. Um, but over the course of the game, we can really see the effects of that. So Hikaru gets the win. And, um, you know, we already looked at Nepo's game with the draw. Now Hikaru gets a win. So he's inching closer, but he goes from being uh, two points behind to just being one and a half points behind. Still has a ways to go. Now, Interesting thing is Hikaru is going to be playing against Nepo. I believe it's in two two rounds from now. And so if he's able to win, that would really give him the, the chances to, to win the tournament. So we'll see what happens. Uh, but let's go ahead and jump over to the next game. All right, guys. Now, the next two games are extremely interesting with some crazy tactics, which I will highlight when we get to them. So I hope you're ready for that. But just keep in mind, Ding was at four and a half. 
along with Hikaru in third place, tied for third, two points behind Nepo going into this round. Report is half a point below that with four. Okay, so let's see what happened. We get a Rui Lopez, which we've seen quite a few of in this tournament. Now, instead of the Berlin variation where the knight comes out to f6 immediately, this is the more of the kind of the classical approach where you just play a6. And for anyone wondering why does white not take the knight and take the pawn, this is kind of a well-known sort of trap, you might say. After knight takes e5, black is going to simply play queen to d4. It's a double attack, and let's just say you move your knight. When black recaptures the pawn, they have a lot of counterplay. The bishops are ready to come out. You have the bishop pair because white conceded it. You're ready to cast along. The rook's going to be active. It's actually just very pleasant for black. And so that is why you will really never see this captures um, at the top level. Or I shouldn't say never, but if they do take, they're not going to take the pawn on e5. They're going to just probably castle or something like this, right? So you might see this line, but you won't see white trying to snag the pawn. So in this case, we see bishop to a4, which is a little bit more popular, knight to f6, d3, b5, bishop to b3, bishop c5, everybody's kind of developing. Bishop to g5, I believe, is a bit of a not played very often kind of a move. Most people are playing knight to c3 or castling or playing c3. Bishop g5, I don't know, let's see. It's been played a few times, but it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare. And it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a totally fine move. I'm just highlighting that it's not really where the main theory is. Okay. H6, D6, C3. This is a pretty standard move in these types of positions. You're dominating the knight on C6, controlling D4. A lot of times you want to play D4 at some point in the future. So you're kind of just setting that up and you give your bishop some, a place to run to if the knight ever attacks it, which it does sometimes. Bishop to A7, an interesting move. Just getting it out of the way so that if d4 happens, it's not going to be hitting the bishop at the same time. We get castles, knight to a5. Like I mentioned, the knight's going for the bishop, and now there's this c2 square. c5, knight to d2, and g5. So one of the things that you'll notice is black has not committed the king to the king side. And when you haven't committed, it gives you more options, such as if you want to be aggressive like this, you can do it uh, without risking so much for your king. Now, at the same time, it is still risky for Black's king because you have to ask the question, where's Black's king going to go now? Like, White's probably going to play d4 at some point, open up the king, and, I, you know, Black has to be careful. But White's king is already over here. This looks like a nice move to gain some space and potentially launch an attack on the king side. So the bishop retreats, knight to h5. We see the same kind of idea where both knights went to the side attacking the bishops. This bishop actually can't uh, hide, right? This one could get away from the knight. In this case, it can't. So a3, rook to b8, king to h1, rook to b7. Lots of maneuvering going on. This is a very interesting idea of bringing the rook up. And sometimes in these positions where, you know, going back here, you notice there's not a lot of tension, right? There's Nobody can really take any pieces except for this right here. This wouldn't really make sense, right? This capture here. Other than that, there's, there's no captures. And so because of that, you can sort of go for some of these slower plans, right? Like, White's playing king h1 and a3 and black is maneuvering the rook around. You can do that because there's there's less tension. So just keep that in mind. Some positions you can't afford to go for plans that are so slow. Uh, but in this case, you know, you kind of can. So b4, bishop goes back to b3 now that the knight's been kicked away. Rook comes over to c7. Now we kind of see the idea. Uh, Ding was basically saying, I, I don't really think my rook is doing anything over here. I'd like it to be on c7 where i'm getting some support along the seventh rank and i also want it on this uh file bishop to d5 g4 things are getting crazy bishop to h4 knight to e7 knight to g1 going back i don't know what's going on it's a stockfish says it's an equal position but it's quite complicated we get a trade here this pawn is hanging but it's black going to take it yes he does knight to e2 rook to c7 and f4. Now, I, I didn't really commentate too much on all of the moves that we just played because I really, honestly, I don't know what's going on. Like, it's a, it's a complicated position. Lots of maneuvering around. This move makes some sense to me. White's trying to open up the position and create some threats on the king. And so this one I kind of understand. But everything else, I, I'm not really sure. I guess the point of giving up this pawn was just 
gain some tempo like you get a free move with your knight and the rook has to kind of waste some time also maybe you you want to bring your rook over and use it to attack i'm not really sure but one thing that we've seen time and time again report is very good at creating these really crazy who knows what's going on type of positions right and he likes playing those types of uh, of games and so i got to give it to him he definitely you know i think accomplished what he was trying to to accomplish here get a crazy position where both sides have chances and and who knows what's going on so f6 just to help defend on e5 we get the trade and by the way the, the pawn on f6 is no longer a target on f7 so that's another reason um but of course it can still be captured here the knight comes over to g3 uh again super complicated position i want to get a little bit further into the game rook to f8 rook takes and queen to d6 there's a moment here bishop to d4 okay yeah right around here let's just kind of talk about what's going on so ding plays bishop to d4 attacking the rook in the corner uh obviously black's king is kind of not safe um and that's what report was going for so he's he says let, let me go after the king sorry about that let me go after the king and the first question we have to answer is well, what happens if the king just takes the bishop well that steps into the queen and so now we have bishop takes e5 with check and white is winning black's queen all right so that's kind of the idea which means the king has to move probably doesn't want to move here which is also in line with the queen so that leaves these two squares and ding decides to go to d7 now why did he go to d7 instead of d8 they're both playable but i imagine the point here is that now it's into a pin so the knight can't move and also on d7 that maybe he's going to just run over here and do something like this run to the other side of the board and kind of hide behind these pawns he's trying to find a safe place for his king so king to d7 now we move the rook right we didn't uh, save it before because we were focusing on on other things but now that that's kind of been dealt with report plays rook to d1 rook comes down to c2 bishop chases it away and now report plays a fascinating move uh if you'd like to pause and think through maybe take a guess what move do you think he played if you haven't seen the, the game already i doubt you'll guess this move Well, if you had a chance to do that, he played the move knight to c4, which is, which is a stunning move if you think about it. And by the way, I should mention both players are getting to that you know point in the game where the time is starting to become a factor. Uh, reports spend about six minutes of his 14 and played this move. And they still have, this is move 33. They still have seven moves to go before they uh, reach the 40 move time control where, where they'll get some bonus time. But it looks like a move that you wouldn't even consider when you look at this position because there's a pawn that can just take it. And it's kind of like, well, why are we giving up our knight for a pawn? Well, that's what Ding does. And he recaptures, and now we can kind of see the point. Look at this rook, and look at this king and this queen. They are lined up. There's only one piece in between. It's this bishop. And if something like c5 happens, like if you imagine black plays a, a bad move over here, uh, c5 is the threat. And once the queen moves, let's just say queen to c6, Bishop takes e5 is, it's over for, for black. There's just, this bishop is gone on d4. It's pinned, right? That pin is just too strong. Rook's attack, the bishop's attack, the king is in trouble. Uh, I mean, there's a bishop, there's a queen, like you name it. It's just bad news for black. So that's kind of the threat. Okay, c5 is happening and black has to figure out how do, how do I deal with this, right? So rook to c6. And let's just talk about what's the idea. If we play c5 going for the same idea, well, now the bishop on f6 is going to get captured and there's no more bishop takes c5 because we just lost our bishop, right? And it's defended by the rook, so we, we can't really do anything. So that's the point. But it does allow bishop a4, which pins the rook. And what we're going to get is after report ends up trading this bishop for this rook, which is what happens next, we essentially have a rook and, let's see, three, four, five, a rook and a pawn versus um a knight and a bishop now if you remember generally speaking the knight and the bishop is going to be better however in this example black's king is not safe at all and so that's kind of the you might say the counterplay that white has for that sort of poor trade right that the king is is exposed so very interesting game and both players are relatively low on time seven minutes and 16 minutes and they still have to make four more moves in an extremely uh, kind of complicated position so b5 going for the king trying to create some open files knight to b4 c5 
again, he doesn't even care about these pawns, right? He wants to open up the files. So he's like, please, like, take take my pawn, you know? Uh, on queen takes c5, there's rook c1, actually, which is just winning for white. And so in this way, of course, uh, loses the queen. So black can't take that pawn. And so c5, queen to e6, bishop to h4, bishop takes c5, rook to c1, pins the bishop to the king, queen to d6, defends it, queen to c4, lining up, knight to d3. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty tactical, but basically everything is defended. So you can't take that because the knight, you can't take this because the queen. There's one move here that white needed to find. They have made time control. So report had time, but he did not play it. And it's a very weird move to find. Uh, if you'd like to pause and think through, what do, you, what do you think the best move here is for white? And if white finds this move, uh, they're, they're probably going to hang on. Okay. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a second to pause. Well, if you had a chance to look at that, the move that white needed to play here was bishop to e7. Really weird move. Um, the point is, first of all, if, if black takes your rook, well, then you're going to take the queen. You're very happy with that. If black throws in this check, you can just tuck your king here on h2, and you still have this sort of tension here. And after, let's just say the queen takes. Now you can take, and you go into this end game, which is pretty equal because you're going to get this pawn, and Stockfish says it should be a draw with good play. Um, and so the same kind of thing, if the queen takes here, you're going to take this, you have the pin and Stockfish says it's pretty equal after king b6, you trade these pawns. And I guess there's probably some perpetual and a bunch of checks. And it's, it's hard for, even though the bishops usually are better, it's going to be hard for black to do anything because of where the king is, right? The, the queen and the rook are going to be able to keep kind of harassing it. The bishops are probably going to have to defend the king, probably going to be a draw. That's what Stockfish said. But report played. Rook to c3 instead, and that was really the turning point, kind of the last chance that he had to, to, you know, get away with a draw from this game. And instead, after rook to c3, he takes b5, queen takes d3, so he does get the piece, which is nice, okay, because now he's up material. The problem is this pawn is actually a, a big threat, right? The pawn, the king, there's two bishops, and white's king is very far. This bishop is kind of out of the action. If you think about it, like where can this bishop move to? One, two, three, four. Well, you you can't really go there. Well, actually, you can. It's check. But what does that accomplish for you? I don't really know. You can't go here. You can go here, but it's already kind of blocked off. The bishop can just sit there and block you off. And you can't go here. So that's really your only move, but that doesn't really help you like stopping this pawn. So the point I'm trying to make is this is a very dangerous passed pawn that white has to be extremely careful about. And so much so that after this, uh, report felt the need to sacrifice his rook. And let's just say he doesn't do that and play, I don't know, you can't bring your king over. Uh, your king is stuck, which is another thing that I forgot to mention. That's what that's what's really bad for white. Um, I mean, you, you can move your rook here and try to like slow down the pawn, but it just, it doesn't cut it. Like black has all the time in the world to kind of maneuver the bishop around, probably take this pawn, probably bring the king up. And slowly but surely, what are you going to do if you're white? You can't move your king. You can't really do any, I mean, I don't know. Right. So it makes a lot of sense to me why he would go this route. And now we get a opposite colored bishop endgame, which if you remember the other game I showed you with uh, Nepo, they had an opposite colored bishop ending and it was a complete draw immediately. Nobody even tried to do anything. Right. What's the major difference about that game and this one? Well, in the other game, if you remember, all the pawns were on one side of the board against all the other pawns on the other on the same side of the board, right? We had four against four with the opposite color bishops. This game, we've got one, two, three, one, two, three, but look at this king and pawn. Massive difference, right? And look at white's king. If you were to just teleport white's king over here, white would be fine, but you can't do that. This king is going to need a bunch of time, look at that, to get over here, and black is not going to wait around. So... That's the big problem uh, with white's position here. So king to g1, he's trying. Here comes the pawn. He's trying to get the king over, right? And this is a really instructive move. Like, if you just play a move like b3, white's going to play bishop to b2. Your pawn is blockaded. Your king can't get in. And guess what? It's just most likely a draw. Okay. And if anything, white's going to have maybe some chances uh, at this point. So what does ding do instead? King to b3. He's not going to allow white's king to just kind of walk over and blockade with the bishop. He's going to use his king as a weapon. And remember, 
active king in the end game is extremely important and that's exactly what we see here so report decides to to run this way with the king now first of all let's just kind of talk about what happens if he tries to come let's just say maybe here to try to block this pawn right black's going to play king to a2 now get ready to support the pawn notice how this is different than from before because now the bishop doesn't have the option to blockade the pawn yet um now you can play king c2 check you can come here and it's it is blockaded but here's the thing black has this very clear idea of playing bishop to b7 you got to save your pawn he's going to take this one you can try to push your pawn it doesn't really matter the bishop can come back here and kind of stop you and now what black is going to do is go right here and use this guy as a decoy to get another pass pawn which is going to be a decoy to lure the bishop away and then they're going to get a queen okay so just to to show you let's just say you go here because you're like no i'm not going to let you do that i'm going to stop it they're going to play h4 anyway you can't take it with your bishop because guess what check and a queen you need the bishop to guard that square you have to leave it there which means your only option here is to do nothing and let this become a queen or take it but now you have this guy and you can't you, like you can't save both pawns you have to choose which one you're going to stop and the other one's going to become a queen right like you can put your bishop here black pushes you do something they get a queen and you got to take it but now they get a queen over here too and you lose so that's kind of black's plan and there's there's really no way for white to stop that and so that's why if we go back here um report said well there, there's no point in going this way there, there's nothing i can do right so he's trying to go this way and maybe at some point you can sacrifice this bishop for this pawn and do something with your king and pawn over here and maybe get black to sacrifice who knows what can happen right king here king goes up and now b3 king to d6 and now i want you to pause at this moment and if you're playing with black what move would you play here All right, if you had a chance to analyze that and come up with your move, how many of you said pawn to b2? I'm just curious because that's honestly probably the move that I would play. If I mean, if I'm in a game, I'm like, I'm going to go ahead and, and get the bishop to sacrifice. And then I'm going to see what happens after that, right? Guess what Ding plays? King to d3. I think this is a super instructive moment because if we play the move b2, which by the way, engine says, okay, it's still winning, but white's going to sacrifice. And then white's going to start pushing this pawn, e5. And the plan is very simple, e6. And if we have to give up our bishop, guess what? White's king is going to be closer than our king. So now it's very tricky and exactly what, you know, black should do. So for example, if you just kind of are very casual about this, e6, if you trade this, guess what? Now it looks like it's a draw. But white's king is closer and, you know, it, it's there's ways to go wrong is what I'm trying to say. Um, apparently you have to play bishop a6. And then after this, you can put your bishop on b5, and then white's king's going to come over. I guess it's still a win for black, but it gets to be very tricky. And so what does Ding do? Is He says, no, I don't even need to do that right now. I still have my pawn. I can push that later. I'm going to come over here and fork these pieces, and I'm going to win a pawn. Unless white, of course, wants to go back where they just came from, which is a complete waste of time. And so nice move. And then after this, he gets the pawn. And now he comes back to finish off the game and here report resigned. So the, the big takeaway I think from this end game is you have to be extremely careful in these end games. Even when you're completely winning, there are, it is very easy to go wrong and just throw the game. And so super instructive end game. Um, unfortunately for, for report, his nice little knight sacrifice earlier, it was flashy. It was cool. It was exciting. Uh, makes it a lot of fun to watch, but it didn't work out in this game. Now, remember I said Ding and Hikaru were two points behind Nepo, and they both won their games. So they are now going to be one and a half points behind, which is in striking distance. If Nepo loses a game in the next couple of rounds, they can very easily catch up. So it's not over yet. Uh, and let's go ahead and take a look at Fabiano's game, who, if you remember, was only one point behind uh, Nepo. All right, so here we go. Duda is white against Fabiano. This was another really interesting game with some amazing tactics, which we're going to be looking at. Keep in mind, Duda is at the bottom of the pack going into this round with only three 
and Fabiano with five and a half is right on the heels of Nepo, and so keep that in mind. But here we go. We get an Italian game, so bishop to c4, bishop to c5, c3. This is pretty standard stuff. Everybody's kind of developing. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can you can play this, a6, a5. Uh, the point with a6 is a lot of times you will like to play b5 and expand, put your bishop over there maybe, and so a4 is saying, no, I don't want to allow you to do that. Bishop goes back to a7. We've seen this move quite a bit in this tournament, and one of the things you want to remember b4 d4 these are moves that white usually plays at some point and so if your bishop is sitting on c5 whenever that happens guess what it's going to be a target you're going to have to move it and so what black does let me go ahead get out of that threat early and so whenever that move happens later i don't even have to worry about that i can focus on on whatever else i'm trying to do so rook to e1 castles h3 we get bishop to e6 and we get this trade. Now, whenever you get a trade like this of bishops, where the pawns become doubled in the center, you get some really interesting dynamics. And, you know, a lot of times we talk about how the doubled pawns are weaknesses, and they can be. Like this pawn on e6 can very easily become a target. I mean, you can even see right now, if white plays queen to b3, black has to figure out how to deal with this, or knight to g5, right? But what do you get as a, in exchange for that? Well, you get this half open f file. Your rook is now involved, and it can be used to attack the king. You also have this bishop eyeing this pawn, right? And if you do want to play d5 and get more pawns in the center, this guy can actually help you. So it's a very interesting dynamic in the position whenever you get a trade like this, okay? Already it's pretty interesting. b4, knight to h5, and this is pretty common. I just talked about how this rook can be involved in the attack while your knight's blocking it, and so now you move it and your knight is, is no longer blocking it. Also, it lets out the queen. Also, the knight can come to f4. And now, all of a sudden... You're starting to see uh, black is getting ready to launch an attack, right? So knight to d2, you know, you, you can't go wrong with a developing move. Um, and so there we go, knight to f1. There's a saying, I've said it on this channel before, with a knight on f1, black has no fun. And so basically, this is a very good defensive piece um, to defend the king. And so that's what uh, Duda is doing here. Getting ready for the attack, which we see happening. Queen to f6. The trade's here, the queen comes in to b3 and now remember we talked about the weakness on e6 now he is targeting it rook to f6 this is kind of a dual purpose move defend the pawn and at the same time maybe i'm going to come over here and try to get an attack going and at the same time open up the square for my rook to have all three of my pieces involved in the attack b5 knight to a5 now uh what's the other saying about knights that we have a knight on the rim is grim right I want you to remember that, okay? A knight on the rim is grim. Right now, the knight's doing something. It's attacking the queen. But after the queen moves, what's the knight doing now? Well, I don't really know. It can't really move anywhere. And it's just kind of sitting there. So keep that in the back of your mind, okay? G5. Now, of course, we can sit here with the engine and say, oh, it's, it's not a good move. But this was um, one of those moves where, where Fabiano was basically saying, hey, I'm trying to catch Nepo. I need to do something, and so here we go. This is it. I'm going to attack the king. Something is going to happen in this game. I might win, I might lose, but I'm going to, you know, try to to, to win as, as much as I can. So I really like that. Um, here we go. The rook comes over. D4. Okay, one of the principles that you should remember when your opponent is attacking you on the flank, one of the best things that you can do, counterattack in the center. That's exactly what we're seeing due to do here. Okay. H5 g3 kicks the queen back brings the rook to the center and so you know some players when they see pawns like this they feel like oh i have to do something to defend immediately like i have to make a move on the king side and notice what what dude is doing he plays d4 he plays rook to d1 and these are good moves by the way um and it just goes to show that sometimes the best thing to do is not not react to an attack do something else to counter attack somewhere else and that's what he's doing here with, with bringing the rook over Rook to g7, king to h1. Now he does play a defensive move. The rook comes over. We get the trade and h4. Now, this move, I think, for a lot of beginners is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Are we not helping black here attack our king by doing this? And basically what it comes down to is one of the best ways to stop queens and rooks from attacking you is to get a nice blockade, okay? 
And that's the kind of the point behind h4. After this is what happened in the game, by the way, takes takes. Look at this g5 square. If white sinks a knight in there, it completely shuts down the g file because this pawn is defending it. And so that's kind of what Duda is going for. And on top of that, the knight on g5 is actually a really aggressive piece, which by the way, remember this e6 pawn, which we said could be a weakness. Guess what? It's going to be targeted. And it sort of, you know, keeps an eye on the king. So really nice idea. Stockfish loves it. And all of a sudden, we can see, you know, kind of what went wrong for black here. Look at this knight on a5. Remember I said earlier, knight on the rim is grim. It's not doing anything. It's just still sitting over there. Can't move, right? The bishop, yeah, it's attacking f2, but I mean, that's defended. And other than that, I don't really know what the bishop is doing. And look at white's knights doing a great job of stopping black's pieces. And then now we start to see that, hey, the rooks are actually starting to be involved in the game. So really nice job by Duda. Brings the rook over to the g file. Bishop does get relocated. And here we go, knight to g5. Like I mentioned, shuts down the g file. And also we get this threat on e6. King to h8. And there is this line here where you just take. Uh, and after the trade, Stockfish says that this is great for white. I'm not sure what Duda saw. Something about that he didn't like, obviously, because he didn't play that. Uh, but played queen to d e2, which is also a good move, bringing it over and going for the attack on the h pawn. Queen to g6. This rook is going to come over to the party on the g file. This is where all the action is. It's kind of shut down by the bishop now, and so this is a nice uh, idea to come over here. There we go. Queen goes back. We get the trade. The rook comes up. The queen's coming over to the party. We got a triple battery on the g file. This is where all the action is. And there were some inaccuracies here. Both players are lower on time, and so it's to be expected. Um, queen to g8, rook to g2. Now, this move is one of those moves that it's like, what are you doing? Like, why would you do that? Like, what in the world could be the idea behind moving your rook up one square like this? Well, there's actually a very amazing point. And after knight to b7, we see the move, which is the top stockfish move and the move that was on the thumbnail, knight to h7. Now, when you first look at this move, you're like, wait a second, one, two, three pieces can take the knight for free, and yet actually none of the pieces can take the knight. So let's start one at a time. If you take with the king, well, black's gonna trade rooks and at the same time fork your king and queen, and now you just lose. If you take with the queen, well, the same thing's gonna happen. He's gonna take the rook and you know, you can't really take it back because you lose your queen. And so you just kind of lost your rook. And if we take with the rook, well, that's the worst of all. You just get mated in one move. So despite the fact there are three pieces controlling that square, none of them can take the knight. It's amazing stuff, right? And by the way, I should mention, um, if we go back to this position before rook to g2 was played, if you try to play knight h7 here, black's going to take on g3. After you take here, they're going to take here, and you're checkmated. Okay? So, going back to the game, if black does the same thing now, guess what? There's no more checkmate. And if you take this, well, you're losing your queen, so that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So, that's why he played rook to g2. Okay? Rook uh, 1 to g2. So, pretty amazing stuff. A nice idea. And, of course, Fabi, you know, finds that, sees that, and so he doesn't doesn't take the knight anyway, and just plays uh, rook over here. And at this point, we get the trade. Knight goes back to g5. And somehow, Fabiano at this point has kind of recovered some of the position. Like, the knight is actually has a path now, knight to c5, where it's going to be in the game and start attacking and doing things. And so it looked like Duda was losing the advantage. You could see it in his face, in his uh, demeanor, or right around this point, kind of feeling like something had went wrong for him and you can see that by the evaluation right like if we go back a couple moves like you know right around here it's pretty it's a pretty big advantage for white now it's not that easy computer saying some crazy lines like queen d3 and then later you queen e2 and it's a lot of dancing around so it's not that easy but if you compare that to here and it's like i don't know black is it looks like black's getting back in this game uh now the other thing to keep in in mind time pressure was a factor here only one minute 
for uh, Fabiano, and he still has to make two more moves. Okay, so keep that in mind. So here, Duda plays the move F4, which is a fantastic move and uh, very tricky. There's a point behind it, and unfortunately for Fabiano, it happened right at that time pressure moment. He has one minute to make two more moves, so you, obviously you don't have a ton of time to think through everything. And so he goes for what kind of looks like a natural move, bring the knight into the action, right? The problem was this F4 move was actually threatening something very, very nasty. And first of all, let's just talk about if you take it, the point is that now you can fork these pieces. And even though it looks like black's going to be able to take it, wing to F3, it's the knight, it's the pawn, and black can't really deal with everything. You, you have to stop this or you're getting checkmated. So if you do something like that, then the queen's going to come down here. You actually lose a piece. So that's one idea. If you take it with the rook, you've got knight takes e6, attacking the rook, rook moves to, let's just say, g4, and you simply take it, and, I mean, white is, is winning in that variation. So because of that, you can't take it. You had to play the move bishop to e7, which is a very difficult move to find in time pressure, and it's still actually better for white even if you play that. But the problem with knight c5 is after the capture, black takes. And now white has a very nice move. If you'd like to pause, what did white play here? This is what happened in the game, by the way. But what did white play here? You got a chance to look at that. The move was knight g to f3, which is a kind of a weird move coming backwards. Uh, but the point is very simple. You are creating the discovered attack on the queen and at the same time creating an attack on the bishop. It's just a double attack and you're winning a piece. White, a Black has uh, no way to stop it. And so he plays queen a8, trying to get a little tricky, okay, with the queen lined up on the king, also potentially coming down here. And it is tricky, um, but Duda does a nice job. Knight h2, f3. Queen comes down, the king comes up. Queen to c1. And at this point, white's just up a piece, you know? And so the game goes on. Black does have a couple of pawns. It does look kind of tricky. And right around here, this is a good one to see. Knight to f2. Uh, again, it's one of those crazy moves where it's like, wait a second, can I take this? And yes, you can. But the point is, if you take with the knight, black's going to be able to take here with the queen. And it's just kind of a fancy trade. And also, if you take with the rook, black's going to take here. Again, just trading. So that's all that was happening there. Um, I should point out, if you think that there's a free knight here, if black takes that, there's rook to a8 check. And when the king moves, it doesn't really matter where, he's in big trouble. On king h7, knight to g5 check, unleashes the queen. Okay, so there were, it was blocked by the knight. Now the knight comes up, and you're winning the queen for free. So the king has to go to g7, but now there's queen to g2 check. And after something like, let's just say king here, you've got a fork. Well, there's a fork here, but engine is saying there's even a faster checkmate if you just bring the queen down and eventually mate in nine. Um, and if the king moves let's see where's the other square king to h6 this is checkmate and if rook to g6 blocking this is the cool line here you've got the fork at the end of everything winning the queen back and so you're just up a rook so lots of fancy tactics but the point from all that is that black can't take the knight that's why fabi played this move to do the fancy trade and yes he has a couple of pawns we go into the end game he does have two pawns for the knight but uh, the knight's just too strong. They played some more moves, but really white just needs one pawn. And basically the knight's going to be able to help the rook take both of these, push it down. And the extra knight and pawn is just too much for the rook to handle. And so we get a few more moves in here. Fabiano resigned. And if you remember what I said, he was, he was one point behind Nepo. Yeah, but now since Nepo got a draw, and Fabiano got nothing. He's going to be one and a half points behind, um, along with both Hikaru and Ding. Okay, so I'll go ahead and throw up the standings after round 10. So here you go. Nepo is in the lead with seven. And then we have a three way tie for second with Fabiano, Hikaru, and Ding. So one and a half points is a lot, but it's not over yet. Right. And so, you know, if if Nepo loses a game in the next couple of rounds, it could very easily they could catch him. If that doesn't happen, uh, then it looks like Nepo is going to win. So we will see the next couple of rounds, like I said, are going to be very interesting. Hope you guys enjoyed this recap. Uh, don't forget in our game, it's your turn. I played E5. Comment what you guys would like to play. And um, having said that, I'll see you next time. Stay sharp, play smart, take care.